change my microphone. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on agroforestry. And I'm, not sure if I'm the one who's supposed to open the proceedings. Am I? Um, Dr. Sharma, um, am I supposed to start? S sir, uh, please unmute, sir. Sharma, sir, you. please unmute yourself. Sorry. Uh, hello, uh, uh, Patrick, sir. Uh, our uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor will deliver one uh, um, address. And after that, uh, you have to make your presentation. Hello, here, anyone? OK, little bit proceedings are there before your lecture. Oh, now I can hear you. Sorry about that. Okay. Problems with my own okay. Okay. Yes, OK. Would you, um, I, I just, shall I start now, or is there some introduction? Some introduction will be there, sir. Some okay. introduction, and uh, there will be a uh, presidential address by Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. S.K. Rao, sir. Okay. After that, Good. your presentation will be there. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's webinar on agroforestry and representative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture can they deliver productive and ecosystem services at scale. I welcome to Honorable Vice Chancellor RVS Gwalior Professor S. K. Rao on the behalf of NHEP IDP team. Under the vibrant leadership of Sir, uh, this project achieving success day by day. I also welcome today's webinar guest speaker, Professor Patrick Worms, Senior Science Policy Advisor, CIOFOR, ICRAF. Welcome, sir. Sir, this uh, this is the fifth international <coughs> webinar under National Agriculture Higher Education Project, which is very ambitious project of ICR and World Bank to improve the infrastructure of agriculture education in India and encourage the student for entrepreneurship. Uh, sir, we hope this one day webinar would help students expand their origin in the field of agroforestry. I request all the students to make use of these two hours to the best of their abilities. Thank you, sir. Now I request our honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor S. K. Rao, sir, to deliver presidential address. Sir, please. Good evening, friends. And uh, it is a good opportunity for all of us, Dr. Patrick Worms, the Senior Science Policy Advisor, is here with today to deliver a presentation, online presentation on agroforestry and regenerative agriculture can deliver a productive and ecosystem services at scale. And this is a very important topic and in terms of agricultural productivity systems. And I think our students and the faculty and the deans, directors who are participating in this uh, online lecture will definitely going to benefit out of his deliberations and so they can take the advantage of this thing. With these few words, I once again thank uh, Dr. Patrick, for accepting, uh, for accepting our invitation from this university to deliver a presentation. Thank you very much for delivering. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, I would like to introduce today's guest speaker, Patrick Worm, sir. Patrick Worm is a Cambridge educated uh, molecular gen gen genetist, represents the world's premier research institution developed to the study of the role of trees in agricultural landscape to policymaker in Brussels and elsewhere in Europe. World, world agroforestry active since the 1970s has uh, reported on the astonishing benefit of multi-crop agriculture involving trees in thousands of peer review publication. Patrick is also president of EURAF, the European Agroforestry Federation, a trustee and treasurer of the International Union of Agroforestry, a member of the steering committee of international land Life piece which work at the in interface between land de degradation and conflicts a senior fellow of the global engineering alliance and a member of several advisory board patrick has been active at the science policy interface since the last 1980s with a star teaching biology in the hindu kush as a young, young european official he then pioneered a new way of using communication to deal with the environmental legacy of communism across the former Soviet Union. Before leaving for the private sector and 
engaging with the disastrous environmental legacy of china's great leap forward and effort with become the first large scale private sector investment in tree planting for watershed remediation in that country with three language a multi multinational family a career spanning four continent and a wide experience in intellectual education patrick received bachelor and master degree from cambridge university with we introduction of our guest speaker now i would invite i would like to invite our uh, patrick sir to deliver his lecture thank you sir thank you very much professor rao dr singh and dr sharma it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to address your august audience today now i am going to try to share my screen and uh, if that works we are on. If it doesn't work, please let me know. Share, share screen. And I'm going to share screen one. Sorry, uh, I'm having a technical issue here. Okay. I'm sorry, I need to change some security parameters on my system. Uh, apologies for the delay. No problem. Sure, please okay. share your screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to do that as soon as I have solved my privacy issue. One moment, please. Right, let's try screen sharing again. Um, must apologize. I seem not to be able to share screens. I'm following the steps indicated by StreamYard, um, but it doesn't work. Let me just see if there's anything else I need to do. No, that's it. And simply. Are you sharing your screen, uh, uh, Dr. I'm Patrick? I, I am trying, um, but I'm having okay. problems. Um, the uh, StreamYard does not seem to be able to access my screen. I am now following the instructions uh, uh, in the that StreamYard is giving me, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. Um, let me see. Uh, share screen again. Application window. My PowerPoint. Share. Are, are you sir, seeing anything? Is my screen being shared? Uh, no, sir. Really not, sir. Uh, lower side of this uh, screen, there is share screen button. Yes, I know all that. What I have yes, done, sir. I pressed on shared screen. Um, I have tried to share, and I always receive the same message. I am reading now. Chrome has lost permission to capture your screen. Follow these steps, and when I click on follow these steps, I get to a Streamyard support screen saying um, that I need to change the privacy setting on my screen recording i have done that um and i still don't seem to be able to do it so please give me a second while i try to deal with my system take your own time sir there is no problem
Okay, um, I'm going to have to relaunch my browser, which means I will lose contact with you. I will log in again. Uh, give me a, a couple of minutes, please. Sure, sir. I think Google, uh, Google, Google Meet is Meet better than that. Uh, okay, uh, I am back. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, let's try screen sharing again. Okay. Shane. Can you see my screen now? Not yet, sir. Not yet. Not visible, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sir. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Yes, sir. Now it's open, sir. Now it's open? Yeah. Okay. Can you, can, can you now see a, a whole screen? Yeah, whole screen. Number of slides on can the screen. See, can you see the first slide or all of my slides? All, all, all the slides. Okay, um, I have, uh, I'm going to try something else. Give me a second, please. Sorry about sure. that. Sure, sir, sure. And let's try share, screen sharing again. Share screen. Click on the number one now. I will hear about the photo. I got a little. A clash we are at the water chat. Video on the other. Ah, first what do you what do you see now i have to sorry yes sir all right you see the wrong yes okay you i i see what you're seeing yes sir now we can like see your slide like to, yeah now you can now you can see the what i'm supposed to see but you cannot see what you are supposed to see um do you understand what i'm yeah this is bizarre yeah um, okay, let me see if I can do it again. Screen one. Great. Now we're there with 15 okay, minutes sir. today. Very okay. sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so let me start again by thanking you all for having organized this session. It's a great pleasure and a great honor for me to be able to uh, to help your students understand and and. Uh, um, explore the wonderful world of agroforestry. And I may add that while the pandemic prevents us from meeting in person, it does make it possible to do things like this, um, to interact across continents uh, at minimal cost and minimal disruption. And that I suppose is a silver lining we should all be very grateful for. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is agriculture in the age of the climate crisis and why we should bet on agroforestry. And the fundamental, hang on, I'm giving you the wrong, uh, I, am, I apologize. I am giving you the wrong presentation. You are, going, you are going to begin to believe that I am the most disorganized lecturer you've ever had. And you may well be right. Let's see. This is what we want. Right. This is what we want. Okay. And here. And this. And here. Right. Can you see my screen now? And it should say agroforestry and land use in the era of earth crisis. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Visible. You can see that. Wonderful. Okay, now I'm going to be talking about the wider context within which agroforestry is going to be so important. And that wider context needs reminding. As you are all aware, the fact that we are so numerous on this planet and the fact that we have developed economies that grow so rapidly is bringing a number of unwanted, unintended, and frankly, rather dangerous side effects this picture was taken in the fires in california a few months ago but beyond that we it's important to remember that this 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 undoubted bounty of better uh, productivity 
is not a global phenomenon. For example, in sub-Saharan Africa, which is an area in which we work a lot, um, the productivity of cereal agriculture has not significantly changed since the 1960s, unlike in South Asia, Latin America, or East Asia. Not surprisingly, that is leading to a great deal of poverty, which in turn is leading to instability. And what this chart shows is simply where the major sources of conflict are in today's world. And that in turn is leading to a large number of desperate people who are migrating. And I should point out here that while this picture shows uh, people in the Mediterranean, most migration does not happen to the rich world. Most migration happens within the global south. So for example, people are leaving countries like Mali or Niger or Burkina Faso to try to make a living in the coastal cities of West Africa in Lagos or Abidjan. And, and what that leads to is, is a kind of vicious circle. You have very rapid population growth in parts of Africa, which means that less following is possible. And following is something that was used traditionally to manage agriculture in the reason, and I should add, manage it well. This area had agriculture for periods going from centuries to millennia, and before European colonization seemed to be managing just fine. I would remind you that Mali, what is today Mali, was in the 14th century, probably the richest country in the world. Um, that, la that, that lack of following is leading to land overuse. And that land overuse is leading to lower soil organic matter, lower soil organic carbon, lower soil microbiome, in turn leading to dropping soil fertility, in turn increasing poverty, malnutrition, and a reaction to poverty around the world is that people tend to have more children. So it leads to population growth. As if that was not problematic enough, this general impoverishment of fertility in the soil also has an impact on the quality of the nutrition that we obtain from the plants that we grow in these soils. And that has an impact on human health, both in terms of gut health and perhaps more scarily in terms of neurological health I don't need to remind you what a problem stunting can be for underfed children. Now, when we tend to think of the, when we tend to talk about the crisis of the earth system, we tend to focus on the climate. And when we focus on the climate, we tend to believe that it's a fairly recent problem, that carbon dioxide levels only started rising in the atmosphere and becoming problematic with the industrial revolution. So give or take in the 20th century. Well, in fact, um, that turns out to be erroneous. Um, if you look at what has happened to climate over the whole Holocene, the last 10,000 years, you notice something odd. The Holocene has been completely stable. We've had pretty much the same climate with variations, of course, um, over the last 10,000 years, but we shouldn't have had. Um, astronomical factors should have meant that we should slowly have been moving towards the next ice age, because as you're no doubt aware, for the last 10 million years or so, uh, planet Earth has been mostly going from one ice age to another with relatively short temperate, uh, uh, temperature periods in between. Yet we did not, we had the stable temperatures. And uh, the reason for that started being elucidated less than 10 years ago, it turns out that the very rapid spread of agricultural techniques starting about 8,000 years ago had a direct impact on the climate starting back then. You had massive felling of trees in the Middle East and in Europe, and that means carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You had the development of wet rice agriculture in Southeast Asia, and that meant methane in the atmosphere. These gases leave traces in the fossil record. These traces have now been found. And the result is that we have enjoyed a climate. So uh, a, a climate that is stable, not because God gave it to us, but because we manufactured this. Um, you have heard of the Anthropocene. It would seem that the Anthropocene is not something that started in the last 50 or 100 years, but something that started about 8,000 years ago. Of course, if you look at the extreme right of all of these graphs, the problem is that this slow buildup of uh, uh, greenhouse gases from pre-industrial times have been completely overwhelmed by the extraordinarily rapid buildup in industrial times. And while the world has been aware of that issue, uh, at least since the 1980s, um, the 
uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed in, 19, in 1992. Um, and while it has done a lot of talking about it, this, uh, this chart lists every single conference of the parties that has taken place uh, since that signature, it has had zero impact, absolutely no impact whatsoever on the concentration of long-lived greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the reason for that is very simple. Carbon is beautiful. Carbon is great. Carbon is a better drug than heroin or than methamphetamines or than anything else that humanity has ever developed. And everybody is getting on the carbon bandwagon. Carbon gives us comfort. It gives us transport. It gives us food. It gives us trade. It gives us all the wonders of the modern world. It's all on the back of carbon. And that is why carbon is becoming a global plague. If you look at this chart, which is probably the scariest chart I've ever seen in a financial publication, which comes from uh, just uh, um, a, a year and a half ago in the Financial Times, um, it lists on a logarithmic scale the increases in carbon emission from a number of countries. And the rich countries are on the left, but the less developed countries are in the middle and on the right. And everybody is following what has happened in the rich world. So we have a real problem because right now our carbon emissions keep on going up and up and up and up. And even the commitments we have made through things like the Paris Agreement leave an enormous gap to what we need to do in order to stabilize the climate of this country. Right now we're living in a pandemic. And in that sense, uh, what is happening with the climate is similar to what is happening with the pandemic. We know that when we have a pandemic, if we do prevention, we, wrap, we, we, we diminish, we reduce the social impact of the pandemic by enormous amounts. And that also means that we reduce its economic impact by enormous amounts. And if you look at the uh, charts on the left, um, all you have to do is compare the pandemic in places like South Korea or New Zealand with the pandemic in places like the United States or the United Kingdom. The first two countries did prevention well and therefore suffered relatively little social and environment and economic impacts. The latter two countries did it rather badly, and as we all know, are now suffering grievously for that mistake. Climate change is a similar problem, except it takes much longer. We're talking about impacts on scales from decades to millennia, as opposed to impacts on scales from weeks to months. And that means it's far more difficult for the world to deal with it. On top of that, as I pointed out, carbon is a marvelous uh, uh, enabler of the modern world, whereas pandemics really have no advantages whatsoever. So it's easy to comparatively to deal with a pandemic, much, much harder to deal with carbon. And of course, there is no silver bullet to deal with it. And it seems sometimes that this should lead us to a certain amount of despair because people are beginning to make good money from climate change by writing books about how horrible it's going to be. And uh, the book on the right has had a, uh, is nonfiction, has had a fair amount of press. I put the book on the left there, The Ministry of the Future, because uh, it is written by one of the best science fiction authors uh, around today. And it opens with an absolutely horrendous scene in India um, in the not too distant future with a couple of weeks of very high wet bulb temperatures in the Gangetic Plain, killing 20 million people. This is not something that is unimaginable these days. The scary thing is it has become all too imaginable. And we already deal with effects like the fires that are happening around the world. And we're used to fires happening in hot, dry places like the Mediterranean or California. But the fact is we now have fires in Siberia, in, in, in Canada, around the planet. And that, of course, is extremely bad news. So is it time to panic, as some people are doing? No, there is hope. And hope comes from a number of uh, places. The first part of hope is to do with us, agriculturalists, because we are an enormous part of the problem, depending, I put these two charts there, because to illustrate the fact that it's difficult to measure, the chart on the left says we are around 30, 30 land use, land use change, forestry and all that. We are around 30 to 31% uh, of the total greenhouse gas emissions, the chart on the right says we are about 18% of it, so we're probably somewhere between the two. But the interesting thing here is that we are the only sector that can continue to produce what it needs to produce while completely getting rid of its emissions and while becoming 
a negative emission sector. And that is a source of hope. The other source of hope is that while there is no magic bullet, there is a magic pizza pie with lots and lots and lots of slices. And if every sector, which is what these slices represents, takes its job of dealing with its own emissions seriously, we can get to grips with the problem. Now, having set this scene, let's just go back to what we are. The basics are extremely easy to understand. If you add trees to the landscape, you have more biomass. Part of that biomass will be below ground and part of that biomass will stay in the ground and put carbon in the soil while you harvest the above ground part of that biomass for food, for fuel, for timber and all the rest of it. So the basics are very, very easy. So that's important. We have a way to deal with a significant part of the climate problem and it is with agroforestry. The second reason for optimism is that the world is beginning to understand holistically what this means. You have things like the Klingendal Institute in Holland, which has launched something called the Planetary Security Initiative, which is studying the interactions between climate change and instability and insecurity and making concrete recommendations about how donors, how states, how the big international institutions of this world should deal with these and encouragingly enough they are beginning to recognize the role that land-based solutions can play. The third reason for optimism is we know how to fix this. The difference between these two pictures is, is minute. It's a couple of years. It's just a bit of good management. Here is an example of what good management can mean. Those of you who have looked at um, um, African situations or African pictures or spoken to African colleagues or African students you might have in your university will understand how important desertification is as an issue there. And when we look at pictures of Africa in the drylands, we tend to see landscapes like this. We tend to see landscapes where everything is absolutely dry. Yet, when we start managing these landscapes differently, these landscapes can be green. I stress that both of these pictures were taken in the dry season, but obviously the second picture, which is a mere two years later, shows you a landscape which is suddenly filled with annual grasses. This was not the result of an expensive seeding effort. It was not the result of plowing or fertilizer or diesel or whatever. It was simply the result of better management. Now here's a picture taken almost 10 years later. This is a picture taken in the wet season, but still what you can see is that the ground cover has become extremely dense. Um, it is now mixed. It is not just a single species any longer. Um, it includes annuals and perennial grasses. This landscape has become more productive. And the same sort of thing has happened at extremely large scales. The picture on the left shows um, a region of the Sahel in Niger in West Africa, uh, a picture taken in the late 1980s. The pictures on the two pictures on the right are of the same area, not of the exact same zone. It wasn't, there was no geothagging in the 80s, so I don't know exactly where the picture on the left was taken. Um, but um, from the same zone around Zinder in Niger, showing that the area has completely regreened. And at the top picture, it looks like a forest, but it's not. If you look at the same landscape at the beginning of the uh, rainy season in the bottom picture, what you see is that it is in fact farmland. You see all that green that is growing under those trees, it's millet, um, and uh, it is growing thanks to the presence of those trees. The same management uh, 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 issues affect how drylands work. Uh, these are ranchers in South Africa. There's two different private owners, one on the right and one on the left. The guy on the right is doing what people have always done. He is letting his cows wander wherever they will, and he's leaving them on the land for a relatively long time before moving them on. When that happens, cows behave exactly like uh, young men when there is an open bar. They will go and eat their fill, sorry, when there is a, a buffet. Um, they will go and eat their fill of what they prefer, and then they will eat what they like less, and then they will eat what they like even less, and they will leave there what they don't like at all. And indeed, what is left in that landscape is mostly tough shrubs and grasses and toxic plants. The ground has desertified, its carbon has been lost. You can see that the tire tracks 
uh, barely making a dent in the landscape. On the left, you have a much richer landscape, and that is uh, because the farmer there is bunching his cattle very densely together, but leaving them no more than a few days on any given patch of land and moving them on. He's using electric wire to do that. That means that grass gets impacted by hooves, by manure, and gets um, uh, uh, browsed once, but then has plenty of time to regenerate after having been fertilized. And that rapidly restores these landscapes. You can tell that the soil is far more mobile. There's far more room in that soil for water to infiltrate simply because the tire tracks are so much deeper. Sometimes you can achieve similar kinds of result with top-down management as happened in uh, the Lose Plateau, an area in central China that is almost as big as France that was desertifying very, very rapidly. The Chinese government with World Bank support decided in the uh, 1990s to do very large scale landscape restoration. This was not done with machines. As you can see, there's a lot of people there with shovels, uh, but the result has been nothing short but spectacular. What you have in effect is large scale terracing, which is now agriculturally um, uh, uh, productive. And the fourth reason for hope is that we understand governance. What you see in this picture is a landscape that those of you who have traveled from Europe to uh, from India to Europe and have taken a window seat in the plain are familiar with. Uh, it is the agricultural landscapes of Western Kazakhstan, Southern Russia and Ukraine. Across thousands of square kilometers, the Soviets planted windbreaks. It's those trees you can see there. And they did so because they had research simply showing that the productivity and the quality of the cereal crops they were planting in between those windbreaks would increase. And indeed, this has been known in a number of different areas. This is from Henan province in China, where you have tens of thousands of square kilometers of mostly Paulonia windbreaks in between cereal fields. In environments in which governance is localized, like Niger, exactly the same sort of thing happened. Um, in Niger, farmers used to have a problem um, with their governance because the Nigerian government inherited an administrative system from the French colonizers and under the French system you need a permit to prune a tree or to cut a tree. That was established during the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century at a time when timber was a strategic resource. You needed timber to build boats for the Navy to beat the English. Um, and of course, in France, uh, it's merely an additional layer of bureaucracy, but France is a relatively sophisticated and efficient country, so that's all it is. In Niger, it can become a real hassle for farmers simply because the, um, these, uh, this permit system is used by agents of the forestry department to improve their incomes. These are extremely badly paid people, um, and uh, they provide fines. They levy fines on farmers who have the temerity of cutting a few twigs for the kitchen fire uh, without having a permit. The result of that is that farmers stop regenerating trees in their landscapes because trees mean trouble and the landscapes desertifies. So the reason why you have this picture where obviously there's an enormous amount of new trees is a change in forestry codes. Here are two satellite pictures, one from 1975 on the left and one from 2003 on the right. You can see how much regeneration has taken place. All that happened is that the Nigerian government put in place incentive systems for the farmers, and the main incentive was simply not to get fined any longer. Um, a perhaps most spectacular example is in, in Tigray, sadly engulfed in a war right now. Tigray is a region in northern Ethiopia, um, which had massive famines in the 1980s. And you may remember uh, the song, Do They Know It's Christmas? I'm sure you've heard it on the radio, which was recorded around that time to raise funds to pay for starving Tigrayans. And the landscape at the time looked just like this. Not a blade of grass, not a tree, just dust, stones, and starving people. Here is what that landscape looked like last year when I visited. It is forested, it is filled with trees, and perhaps most astonishing to me, um, a mere 25, well, 30 years after the famine, 
the farmers there are rich enough so that they're plowing with oxen, not by hand. And in Africa, that is a real sign of wealth. And the difference here is that Ethiopia managed to solve a fundamental problem that faces all poor countries, which is that poor countries cannot generate enough tax revenue. In a rich country like Belgium, where I live, um, or India, which is now wealthy enough to do the same thing, um, it's very easy. If you need a check dam to be built, as you have in this picture, um, the state will simply contract the contractor to build a check dam and will pay that contractor using revenues raised from taxation. Ethiopia, of course, cannot afford to do that. It doesn't have any revenue raised from taxation because the vast majority of its country is poor. So what it did instead was to mandate that every year, every able-bodied inhabitant had to give a certain number of days of free labor as a community in lieu of taxation. Now, the interesting thing here is the state did not mandate what the communities had to do. The communities could decide by themselves whether they were going to invest that labor to build a road or to terrace some hillsides or to build a check dam. But during the agricultural half season, when it is time to produce that communal work, the communal work was being done. And the result has been absolutely superb work. And just like in, in, in India, in, in Andhra Pradesh, you have things like zero-based natural farming, uh, which was uh, an, an Indian innovation that is transforming Indian agriculture in Ethiopia. This was mostly done by Ethiopian researchers and Ethiopian workers. Uh, this is Niguze Hagazi. He's a colleague of mine at World Agroforestry, and he was instrumental in helping that particular region um, uh, 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 regreen. Um, you see these governance effects absolutely everywhere. Here's an example from, uh, from Kenya. Um, the farm on the left has clear tenure to its land, and uh, so the farmer has planted trees in addition to the annual crops. He has or she has tenure and so can invest over the long term. On the right, um, it's in a very similar area, so similar soil, similar rain, uh, uh, rainfall. Uh, the land has not been adjudicated, so you are not going to invest in that land. You're just going to plant your annual crop this year or this season, hope that you can harvest before somebody kicks you off. And that's an enormous difference as well. Sometimes the difference is shockingly visible from space. These are two, these two pictures compare the extent of forest cover and ivory cover between 1990 and 2015. The only forest left in 2015 really is a national park on the left there. Everything else has been invaded by farmers, cut down and turned into mostly cacao plantations. And that is simply because while forest protection legislation was there, it was never enforced. On top of that, in Côte d'Ivoire, until very recently, uh, the legislation made a difference between exotic trees, which a farmer planted, and native trees which regenerated in the land. Exotic trees automatically belong to the farmer. There's no question about it, no argument about it. Native trees that regenerate belong to the Forest Service. And once in, in this uh, humid tropic environment, some of these native trees, when they have grown and are adults, are worth literally thousands of dollars. And the forestry department had the right to come into a farmer's field and to take these big trees away and to sell them, compensating the farmer with, with a few dozen dollars for damage done to his field in the process. This, of course, did not encourage farmers to maintain or to regenerate native trees in the landscape. And the result is a very rapid disappearance of the landscape in that country. Now, the law has changed. The, 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 the Ivoirian government has realized what a terrible mistake it had made in this regard. And efforts are ongoing for regreening. I hope they are successful. And I hope that in 15 years time, I will be able to show you another chart that shows you great progress. Here's another example from Africa. Um, and here it's a cultural governance issue between genders. In Burkina Faso, where this picture was taken, um, women do not have clear tenure to their fields. Tenure belongs to men. But women and men have different responsibilities. Men's responsibility is to grow crops for the market and make money and then to spend that money. Women's responsibilities is to grow food to feed their own families. What this means is that if a woman improves the fertility of her field too much, um, the man might take it over in order to grow his own crops. 
So there is an incentive not to improve fertility too much. And that is why, for example, here these cows are being left to uh, 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 eat the stover whichever way they like, rather than to be concentrated to ensure their manure and their fertility actually improves the productivity of that field. Um, the name Champ du Soir, that's French, that simply means evening field. It is the fields that women are managing in the evening. Sometimes it is the best, most noble human instincts that result in terrible governance. And here's an example from Portugal, where massive, massive fires killed over 100 people two years ago. The result of land abandonment. And land abandonment came because after the socialist revolution, which re-established democracy in the mid-1970s, inheritance law changed in Portugal. Until then, the oldest son received the farm. After that, um, every child received an equal share of the farm. This coincided at a time of rapid industrialization in Portugal, so a lot of people left the land to go and work in the cities. And as one generation passed to the next, the land was divided and divided again. So the land was abandoned. Shrubs started growing. Because you had lots and lots of plots of less than a hectare, it made no sense for somebody to try to manage that land with animals. A silver pastoral system, goats and cattle would be the standard way of managing those landscapes. So they didn't. So the shrubs simply built up, and all it took was a spark to set the whole thing ablaze. Yet, when you do it well, when you do governance well, suddenly everything changes. The conservancies in Kenya are a beautiful example of that. Conservancies, conservancies simply mean that a landscape is managed by all of the people inhabiting that landscape together, um, mostly uh, uh, um, on the basis of a tribe, and uh, they are planning and allocating resources amongst tribal members together. And these resources tend to be traditional resources involved with farming, such as livestock or crops, but also, of course, in a place like Kenya, tourism. And the result has been a rapid increase in the density of wildlife in that country. And this is not exceptional. My hero in amongst economists is Elinor Ostrom, who was until last year the only woman to win the Nobel Prize, I'm sorry, until 2019, I should say, the only woman to win the Nobel Prize for, econ uh, for economics. And Elinor Ostrom uh, studied hundreds of what she called these common pool management systems. Um, and they apply to pasture land, to forests, to fisheries, even to the electromagnetic spectrum, when, which has to be shared out between a number of different users. Um, these are far more sophisticated and far more successful management system than the simple dichotomy between public ownership of land and private ownership of land, which is common in countries with Anglo-Saxon influence like the US or Australia. Now, that's the good news. We can change the landscape. And the better news is that you don't need an enormous amount of capital to do it. You don't need new innovative chemicals or better tractors or more GPS or artificial intelligence. No, all you need is a pair of human hands and human brains. It's about the management. Now that I've set this scene and given you back a little bit of hope, let's see on what regenerative agriculture can actually deliver. Now, regenerative agriculture is really five different classes of systems. First, you have silver pastoral systems, where you are growing animals on the trees. And you have examples here from Poland on the top left, from Finland on the top right, from Portugal on the bottom left, and from Burkina Faso on the bottom right. You have examples that are quite industrialized, like this one in Holland, where poultry is grown between in an apple orchard. What the uh, poultry is doing, it's controlling pests, it's fertilizing the apples uh, and it's keeping the grass growth under control. What the apples are doing is providing uh, a psychological shelter to chickens. Chickens are a jungle bird originally. Um, they need trees to be truly free range. Without trees, they will tend to congregate near some kind of shelter because they're afraid of raptors. Nobody has managed to explain to them that there are no more raptors in Holland, but there you go. Um, so having trees out there ensures that the um, that the chickens actually work on and fertilize the entire landscape and also increases the chicken productivity. 
Um, in olive systems like these ones in Italy, the same thing is being used in a perhaps more extensive, less intensive fashion. Um, in um, Poland, uh, and indeed in other parts of Europe, these uh, intensive grazing systems are being used. You can see the electric wire just to the right of this cow. Uh, the land to the right of that cow was browsed a couple of days before that picture was taken. The field in which they are in now, the, the plot in which they're in now, they were brought in that very morning. You can see at the back there's another wire preventing the cows from going into the land beyond that. Um, so you can see from that that the, uh, the plots in which these cows are being kept is very, very small. They're going to be kept on that plot for a few days until the land on the left looks like the land on the right, and they're going to be moved to the land behind it. Um, this very rapidly and very durably improves the productivity and the fertility of that land. And here we have that example from Burkina Faso again. Now, moving on, we also have so-called silver arable systems. And here you have examples from France. This is perhaps the most iconic example in Europe because it shows that it is possible intensively to combine the growing of cereals with the growing of wood for timber, these are poplars, in ways that enhance the productivity and thus the income of farmers. But of course, these kinds of systems are widespread across other production systems. Here in Belgium, you have fruit trees and vegetables being grown together, or you have poplars uh, that are being added to a pasture, which is top seeded with cereals. In Niger, we've already looked at that picture, you have sorghum and millet, which is growing on the Phytherbia albida trees, these, these gray trees you see there. And of course, you have the fruit trees around the farms, what you see at the top right. In Zambia, you have an intensive system of maize with this same tree, Phytherbia albida, which is being tried in a conservation agriculture setting, extremely productive. In Nicaragua, they're using timber species to shade coffee. Coffee is a shade-loving species. The quality of the beans that you get is going to be higher. Uh, in shade, even though the productivity is going to be slightly lower, but you don't care about that because you're also getting money from the timber. So you're again getting this higher system productivity, even though individual productivity of components might be different. And here's an example, which is one of my favorites because it's an inverted agroforestry system. The crop are the coconuts and the uh, agroforestry component um, are the uh, glyricidia shrubs, which are grown in between. And as you can see, uh, they have been uh, regularly coppiced from a main stem. Um, the beauty about this tree, Glyricidia, is it has extremely long shoots, which are covered with very nitrogen-rich leaves. It's extremely easy to strip the leaves from the shoots and leave the leaves on the soil or work them into the soil to add fertility to that land, while you can take these long shoots, bundle them, and sell them to the nearby biomass to energy plant, which is what's happening in this particular landscape. Um, when we, as we're talking about biomass to energy, you may know that Europe has a mandate to improve, increase uh, the amount of biomass energy it uses. And uh, here is an example from the UK where they are do, growing a willow coppice in uh, between a uh, rotation that involves potatoes, wheat, uh, and soybeans, if memory serves. You then have, excuse me, I'm just going to close the door. I notice my family is uh, busy in the next room. The third type of, of major regenerative systems are, are polycultural systems, and they're often by far the most productive systems at all because they are the most truly three-dimensional systems. They involve many different trees, growing vines, annuals, shrubs, and livestock. And while they are very difficult to manage from the perspective of a buyer, because you're not just dealing with a farmer producing one commodity, but with a farmer producing 10 or 15 or 20 different commodities, they are by far the most productive in terms of biomass production and nutrition production. And here you have examples from Tanzania, the famous Chaga Gardens. If you're interested in these systems, I warmly encourage you to read up around uh, about these gardens. You have an example from Wisconsin, a former maize farm that has been completely transformed using key lines into a system that's producing mostly nuts and livestock. Um, you have this uh, system in Uganda. This gentleman is growing coffees, bananas, and vanilla, 
And interestingly enough, he's using the trophy, the picture uh, at the very front. You can barely see it, but that vanilla vine is growing on a severely pruned Latrofa tree, um, not for productivity, but because apparently it helps the vanilla grow so much better. So you have all this constant innovation, experimentation going on in these polycropping systems. And here is a system we as World Agroforestry are particularly proud of that we have helped to develop and monitor in Brazil. It's an oil palm production system. Its productivity for oil is higher than that of a monocrop. And on top of that, it produces a range of other things in a dynamic way, because when the palms are small, you can have ground crops such as annuals or vegetables. But as the trees grow, you then start having various tree crops, some of them listed here. You then have the grassland systems. And the grassland systems are important because we have a tendency to ignore them, yet they are massive. The grassland systems are amongst the largest biomes on Earth, and they are present absolutely everywhere, from the Arctic to the Tropic. And the way that grassland systems operate is, or have operated historically around the planet, is exemplified by this picture taken in one of the few areas where these grassland systems still survive more or less unimpeded. What you have is extremely large numbers of different herbivores, some of them very large like elephants, that are keeping forest growth under control and that are migrating across this landscape following the rains in a way that allows that landscape to regrowth. And the grasses growing in that landscape, these are uh, species from the plains in North America, um, have a particular useful characteristics in this time of earth crisis. They go very, very deep into the soil, several meters deep in many cases, so far, far deeper than the grasses we typically use for our lawns or for improved pastures. And as they're being browsed, um, the root system dies back a little bit to regrow the lost leaves and leaves carbon behind. The lost leaves then produce more sugars, the root system regrowth, and this pulsing system of year-round carbon deposition in the soil is what created Chernozem soils, which are the richest soils on the planet, the ones you find in Ukraine, in Kansas, or here in this case in, uh, in, in parts of Holland, um, which are soils that are so fertile that you can mismanage them for decades before you start suffering the consequences. Now, of course, in the modern world, we cannot simply reintroduce lions everywhere to restore our grasslands. But what we can do is use electric wires uh, as this farmer in Poland is doing. And this kind of grazing called adaptative multi-paddock grazing is spreading fairly rapidly around the world, mostly in North America, in Australia, and in South Africa. But as you can see from this example, in, uh, uh, in, in Europe as well. And I've already spoken about this. Um, this being said, I'm finally getting to agroforestry. I promised you a lecture on agroforestry, and I've been talking for 40 minutes, and I have barely spoken about agroforestry. So now let's drill down into why trees are so important in landscapes. And what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to give you a detailed scientific explanation, because what I want to do is to make you, as the students, interested in exploring this wonderful field by yourself just by giving you some basic principles. Principle number one, trees have deep roots. That means they can pump nutrients from deep soil horizons and they can distribute these nutrients to the soil surface and thus to your crops with leaf and litter fall. It's extremely simple, but you'd be surprised the number of farmers who ignore this. These deep roots are useful to manage nitrogen leaching, which is great if you're using a lot of fertilizer. They simply pump and use the excess fertilizer that a farmer might put in his field, which is great for the quality of your water supply. And talking of water, these tree roots also help water buffering because trees act as giant rain catching devices. The water from the rain runs along their branches and trunks and their roots to enter the soil. If you have trees, the water has less tendency of simply running off into the rivers. You reduce erosion notably because of this process. And for relatively short droughts, the water that is stored in the soil helps your crops to continue growing when the crops without the benefit of trees will stop growing for lack of water.
And indeed, at larger scales, we now know that trees are essential to water recharge. What you see in this diagram is a comparison of three situations, a, a desert, a degraded situation on the left, a full closed canopy forest on the right, and a mixed agroforestry system in the middle. And what you have in open degraded soils is a lot of hard pan, a lot of the water simply runs off, that's in uh, orange. Uh, the sun is beating hard, a lot of the water simply evaporates away, that's the yellow arrow. So very little water infiltrates, that's the green arrow. Very little water is intercepted by trees and transpired again, that's the red arrow. And very little water recharges groundwater. If we go to the extreme right, where you have this closed canopy forest, what you have is, yeah, you have a lot of infiltration, but you also have a lot of evapotranspiration or transpiration and interception. So you have a lot of water going back into the atmosphere, and you also have relatively little groundwater recharge. The sweet spot for groundwater recharge is when you have intermediate tree cover. There, you have more transpiration, of course, than you have in degraded lands, but less than you have in forests. <coughs> you have a bit more soil evaporation than you have in forests, but far less than you have in degraded lands. And you have significant infiltration, a lot of which ends up in ground water. And what's really, really encouraging here is that the pioneering work to uh, measure this was done in Africa Sahel region. So right at the boundary of the Sahara, where water is the limiting factor for agriculture. And in certain areas where agroforestry systems had been reestablished the longest and where groundwater depth had been measured, you've had groundwater rising by 15 meters over three decades, which is absolutely fantastic. And I know that India has some dry areas as well where this intermediate tree cover presumably would have an extremely similar effect. Now, the crops also protect the trees, and they do that by crowding out the roots from near the surface area. Um, this is an experiment that was done in a uh, wheat walnut system on the right and the walnut agroforestry system on the left in southern France. And what it measures is the density of rootlets per cubic meter of soils by depth. And as you can see, in the forestry system, most of the roots are close to the surface. In the agroforestry system, most of the roots are further down because close to the surface, the crops are hogging all the space. And that has an important benefit for the trees because if a drought is coming, in the forest system, most of the tree rootlets are going to be affected by the drought. The tree is going to stop growing. It's going to be conserving its water resources. In the agroforestry system, most of the rootlets are not affected and the tree is going to carry on growing, which is why in this particular experiment, the woody biomass productivity of the two systems was identical. While on the right, of course, you also had the production of wheat. So the, this was one of the most foundational pieces of work showing why and how agroforestry can be so much more productive. I've already spoken about the, uh, the important role that other ecosystemic services play in these systems, notably pest control uh, and fertilization. But that is barely known by farmers. And the reason I say that is that this picture is a picture I found on the website of a fertilizer company. And what it shows is an absolutely, what they consider to be an absolutely gorgeous agricultural landscape in Europe in the summer. What I notice is no photosynthesis, no use of water at a time of year when we have 16 hours of sunlight and regular summer storms. It's an absolute disaster from an agricultural perspective. In the agroforestry system, at the same time, what you do, of course, have is photosynthesis continuing because of those trees. And again, these kind of, of, of impacts have been measured not only for nutrition and for water, but also for sunlight. And what you see here is a 40-year-old experiment, also done in southern France, which is comparing the sunlight utilization rate in a wheat system on the left, in a forestry system in the middle, and in an agroforestry system on the right. It's the same system as the one I showed earlier, so it's a wheat walnut system. And this is what it looks like. This is the wheat walnut system in question. So what you have there, and I want you to focus on the black area, which simply looks at the amount of wasted sunlight. Wheat is a winter crop. So a lot of the sunlight is wasted in the pure wheat system on the left. 
Um, walnuts are deciduous trees. They leave fairly late, typically May, uh, and they lose their leaves uh, around October. So there's a significant amount of sunlight they're not using, even when they are fully ground and grown. And of course, they use very little right at the beginning when they are mere saplings. In the agroforestry system, what you notice is two things. First, as time progresses, the amount of sunlight utilized by the wheat is going down as the tree crown becomes larger and larger. But the total amount of wasted sunlight over that 40 year period is smaller. More of that sunlight has been used by photosynthesis on this plot than in either of the two monoculture plots. And that leads us to the most foundational um, equation in uh, agroforestry, the so-called land equivalency ratio. It's extremely simple. All it does is it measures the amount of monocrop cropland you need and monocrop forest land you need to achieve the same biomass productivity as one hectare of agroforestry. And in this theoretical example, you notice that to achieve the same productivity as a hectare of agroforestry, you need 0.8 hectares of agriculture, 0.6 hectares of forests, and thus the land equivalency ratio is simply 1.4. Or another way of expressing that is the agroforestry system is 40% more productive than the monocrop systems. And this has been measured in a number of places around the world. So here's an example from Mali, where they have intercrop cowpea with maize, and there the productivity is 47% higher. Um, here is an example from, um, uh, from Java in Indonesia, where teak was intercropped with maize. There the productivity is almost twice as high as it is in the uh, monocrop systems. And here is that oil palm agroforestry system whose picture I showed you earlier. And as you can see, there are two different uh, composition uh, species mixes, uh, which is why you see two agroforestry bars uh, compared to the monocrop bar in uh, brown and that is just to remind you that is just measuring the oil yield it is not measuring the rest so the total productivity is even higher and to give you an example of how the calculation is being done here we are back at this uh, willow alley cropping system for for biomass and what they've done there is they simply measured it's a it's it's a, it's a research station it's called the organic research center uh, they measured um, the productivity of a short rotation plantation willow coppice. And uh, if it's only that, they get 8.3 oven dry tons per hectare. And of organic wheat, and if it's a monocrop, they get 5 tons per hectare. In the agroforestry system, 20% of the land is devoted to willow, 80% of the land is devoted to wheat. Um, of that 80%, about 67% uh, of the total area is uh, full sun wheat, 13% uh, of the land is wheat that is shaded 50% by the willow. Um, so what is the productivity there? Well, the 20% of land under willow produce 3.3 oven dry tons, and the wheat is producing 5.1 tons. So even the wheat is only growing on 80% of the land rather than 100% of the land, the productivity of the wheat is slightly higher than it is in a complete monocrop system. And to calculate the land equivalency ratio, that's the equation at the bottom, you simply take the agroforestry yield for the tree and divide it by the monoculture yield, and you add to that the agroforestry yield for the crop and divide it by the monoculture yield for that crop. And here, um, what you have is a land equivalency ratio of 1.43, so 43% higher productivity. In tropical areas, these land equivalency ratio can be much, much higher. Here, the land equivalency ratio is literally infinite. Why? Because the denominator was zero. In that landscape, with rains that last one to three months and then 10 months of really, really hot, dry weather, crops do not have time to grow and generate a yield before they stop photosynthesizing, unless you have trees. This landscape is now generating, there's a zero missing there, that should read 10 million tons, um, is now, uh, uh, sorry, there is no zero missing, my, my confusion. Um, that landscape is now generating a much, much more millet than before. Um, what you also find is that trees, the fertilizer effect of trees, especially of legumes, um, can have an impact on the land, on the soil, which is at least as good as that of inorganic fertilizers and can even 
exceeded. Um, this is measurement that was done 10 years ago in Malawi. Uh, these are not research results, these are farmers' results, so we simply measured the yield in farmers' fields. Um, the, in that season, the farmers that were, had no trees and no fertilizers managed to grow about 1.3 tons of maize per hectare. Those who used fertilizers, and there were far more fields with fertilizers because Malawi has a fertilizer subsidy program, generated about 1.7 tons per hectare. But those who had trees generated three tons per hectare. And those who had trees and still used fertilizers also generated three tons per hectare. Clearly, what this data shows is that if you want to rapidly boost the productivity of maize farming in Malawi, you need to focus on regenerating or planting fertilizer trees and abandon the extremely expensive and not very effective fertilizer subsidy program. Here's an example of what happens with these permaculture systems compared to monocrops. This is in Sumatra. What you have at the top left is a typical rubber plantation in the area. What you have at the bottom right is a uh, what is called a jungle rubber garden. In effect, a small polyculture farm. And you can see there, uh, there's terraced rice at the bottom and that rice uh, terrace will also have ducks and fish. You can see bananas. You can see a little bit of maize on the bottom left. You can see some shrubs, which are either coffee or cocoa um, under the rubber trees in the middle. And then you can see timber trees on the top. You can see it's very mixed and very dense. And if you compare uh, these things, what you find is that the plantations are much, much larger. Um, the jungle rubber gardens are much, much smaller. But the productivity of the plantations is lousy compared to the productivity of the rubber gardens. They made in the year when this was measured, uh, they made about $800 per hectare per year, whereas the jungle rubber gardens made about $3,000 per hectare per year. That's because the rubber plantation only had one value chain, and so it's completely dependent on international commodity prices. And rubber prices, like the prices of many commodities, has a tendency to extremely wild swings and that heterogeneity adds an enormous degree of risk to that plantation. In the jungle rubber garden, by contrast, the typical farmer has more than 10 different value chains. So if the price for something drops, he can sell something else. And if the price for everything drops because there's a nuclear war and the world is going to the docks, it doesn't matter. He still has something he can eat. It's simply much more resilient from an economic perspective as well as from a biophysical perspective. It's also interesting for ecosystemic services, the biodiversity ratio compared to uh, the rainforest that was there before is about 60% in the jungle rubber gardens, but less than 2% in the plantations. Um, it's much better in terms of phytosanitation pollution because phytosanitation use is practically nil. Um, and the social costs are very nil. In the plantations at the top left, you're not growing any food, so you're completely dependent on uh, buying food from your salary. Um, the only livelihood to be had is to manage that plantation, which in practice means spraying a lot of pesticides, which is not great for your health. Um, whereas in the bottom right, of course, you have far more livelihood options and you have far better and more nutritious food. The total environmental costs of the jungle rubber systems are therefore much lower than the plantations. However, the jungle rubber systems are disappearing while the plantations are spreading. And the reason for that is very simple. If I am a commodity trader, I can call one guy in the plantation. He has 5,000 hectares. I can sign a contract with him to supply me with an agreed quantity and quality of product. And I only have to send one kind of truck over there. I have to deliver that to one kind of processing facility. And I have to sell that into one global commodity chain. Easy. If I'm going to a landscape of jungle rubber farmers, I'm suddenly dealing with a 1,000 different farmers on a landscape of 5,000 hectares each of which is growing a multiplicity of different things. And if you add it all together across that landscape, you probably have 20 or 30 different things with everybody producing widely different um, degrees of quantity and quality. So instead of dealing with one guy and buying one product, I have to deal with a thousand guys and buy 50 different products and have 50 different processing facilities. And, and, and I'm not going to do it. The world is not going to do it. And that leads us to a fundamental issue with agroforestry. Agroforestry is more productive. Agroforestry is better for ecosystem services. But agroforestry is hitting, always hitting the barriers of a modern world that only measures things according to a single metric, which is profitability. And we'll get back to that later. 
And I just want to leave you with this final example. Uh, you can even get the benefits of agroforestry without using any trees whatsoever. This is called agrivoltaics. And agrivoltaic systems are systems where you're taking the solar panels, but you're putting the panels on stilts and you are distributing them so that you have about 50% shade on the soil under it. And under that, you can do horticulture, you can do arable farmings, and you can do pasture land, and all of these things have been done. And the measured land equivalency ratios for that are somewhere between 1.3 and 1.7. It's one of the most promising things that, uh, that you can find. I know that India has big plans to expand its um, uh, uh, photovoltaic uh, energy production, and I hope that it will take on board the lessons of this and not simply put the panels on the soil, a mistake that was made in pioneering countries like Germany. Trees are also crucially important with water, for water, and without going into the debates of things that have not yet been proven about whether they influence wind and uh, how I, exactly how important they are for influencing wind and water transport, it is clear that trees influence global water transport patterns. Remember global wind patterns exemplified on this chart. As we move to the next chart, I just want you to remember a simple thing. In the um, uh, temperate latitudes, uh, winds tend to go from west to east. In the tropical uh, latitudes, winds tend to go from east to west. In Southeast Asia, they tend to go from southwest to northeast. And so let's see what that means. The first thing it means is that in large areas of the world, an enormous amount of rainfall comes from evapotranspiration. Um, northern China, Mongolia, a lot of Siberia, parts of northern India and northern Pakistan and Central Asia, most of the rain that falls there did not come from the ocean. It comes from evapotranspiration. It took a while for this to trickle through to uh, global science because global science was until fairly recently dominated by people who live in Western Europe and in the UK. And there, as you can see, the vast majority of rainfall does indeed come from the ocean because we're right here in Belgium, we're right next to the ocean, um, and our winds come from the west. So the rainfall here is almost exclusively uh, rain that originated from the oceans. But in Africa, Sahel, in the Sudan, in uh, central West Africa, in uh, southern Brazil, in Bolivia, most rain originally evapotranspirated from somewhere. And if you look at that across the world, and if you measure that across the world, and you can measure it because oxygen isotope ratios are different in uh, water that uh, has been evapotranspirated than water that comes straight from the ocean, you find that anywhere between 30 and almost 70% of all rainfall measured originated with plants. It's crucial. And what that means is that countries have an impact on countries a long way away, depending on how they manage their land. F focus here on East Africa. Almost all of the rain that falls in places like Kenya and Uganda is evaporating. Where does it go? It ends up in the Sahel. If you want more rainfall in the Sahel, you need to plant trees in Kenya and Uganda. A similar thing is happening in China. If you look at the chart here, the rainfall that evaporates in Southeast Asia lands in China. And what China, what Chinese businessmen that are currently logging uh, rainforests in uh, Burma, uh, Thailand, and Laos at an accelerated rate are doing is simply reducing their own rainfall. The Chinese are acting like the idiot in the cartoon who is sawing away the branch on which he sits. Trees matter, not just for local productivity, but for global rainfall productivity as well. They also matter for nutrition. We live in a world in which almost a third of people are overweight or obese, and in which still a significant proportion of people are undernourished and malnourished because they don't have the right amount of nutrition. And the reason for that has to do with culture as much as with anything else. Um, when a donor sitting in a glass tower in London or Washington looks at this picture, he probably thinks it's a mess. Yet what you see is a system in Mesoamerica, the Milpa system, which has maintained high population densities of people um, with nutritious food for centuries. Whereas these systems that exemplify modern agriculture um, have no people, no nutrition, no trees, 
and frankly, no photosynthesis except for a few months of the year. We can measure the lack of nutrition by using uh, the, the lack of um, uh, micronutrition by looking at the amount of fruits and vegetables that people are eating on average. And what you find is that South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are by far the worst in that regard. Um, places in East Asia and the Pacific, uh, and especially in the Middle East and North Africa, um, are eating uh, enough fruits and vegetables, um, but uh, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa doesn't. And that leads to stunting, and we've already talked about it. And India shares with a number of African countries the distinction of having about 40% of its kids being moderately or severely stunted, which is a massive disaster for, for development because stunting is not just a physical issue, but a mental issue as well. It means these kids will be less able to do well at school, and that means that over their entire life, they will earn less money and they will be able to, in turn, be less good parents and because they will not be able to feed their, kid, their own kids properly. So breaking that chain is absolutely crucial. And you can do it in two different ways. Um, you can do it by um, using modern biotechnology. And you may have heard of golden rice, which is a form of this technology. And what golden rice tried to do is to put a create a staple crop that would be consumed across Asia that would help kids um, obtain sufficient quantities of vitamin A because the dearth of vitamin A leads to blindness. And indeed, if you look at the top central chart here, golden rice will provide you with more vitamin A than white rice on the left. But so will a diet of white rice with a fat carrot or with two medium-sized carrots or with some cassava leaves or some moringa leaves on the top right. And if you start adding an orange to that bottom left and some beef, some meat or some lentils bottom right, uh, bottom center uh, and some spinach bottom right, you suddenly find that you're not only dealing with a vitamin A problem, but also with all of the other micronutrient problems. So clearly it's by increasing the agrobiodiversity that people have access to, by increasing the amount of foods that they eat, that you're most rapidly and most cheaply going to be able to deal with their micronutrient deficiencies. Because if you're trying it by repeating the feat, and it, and it was a feat, it wasn't easy to do, the feat of engineering vitamin A into golden, uh, uh, into rice to create golden rice with all of the other nutrients, you're going to be needing an enormous amount of work in biotechnology to achieve a result that is in the end not going to be as good as simply planting a few more trees in your field. So if I have convinced you that this is important, then what can you do in practical terms of agroforestry to increase that agrobiodiversity? Well, the most important thing is to add some fodder trees as hedges to your system, because fodder trees, um, especially if you use things like leukina here, um, they are um, very nitrogen rich and they are a fantastic boost to the milk productivity of your milch cow. Um, since milk is one of the foundational foods for kids, this is an easy way of dealing with a nutrition deficiency. The second is to focus on foods, but not just any foods, on indigenous foods. And that's because indigenous foods are usually way better and have much higher micronutrient content than exotic foods. I'll just invite you to look at the vitamin C column, the column on the left. Adansonia digitata is baobab, and as you can see, it has between three and ten times more vitamin C than orange, which is the fruit, the citrus fruits that all of us are always recommended eating to get our vitamin C um, doses. And the same applies to a number of other nutrients. And most interestingly, what you can do when you have these trees is create a tree suite that gives you nutrition at the time when you need it most, during the hunger season, when you are running low on your stores from last year's cropping, but you are not yet harvesting from this year's cropping. And here is an example from Western Kenya, uh, where the hunger season is March to May. And if you plant the four, uh, sorry, the six or seven trees listed here, bananas, lemons, jackfruit, guava, avocado, syzygium, and orange, you are going to get not only the micronutrients you need during the hunger season, but also thanks to things like banana and jackfruit, the calories you need during the hunger season. And you can do this sort of thing for any landscape. Here's another example from West Africa. And at World Agroforestry, we've done this for dozens of different landscapes. 
we know what tree suites to plant in those landscapes to deal with nutritional issues. And we've done it in India as well. Now, another way that, 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 that you can help there is simply by helping people access good germplasm. And we tend to think of good germplasm as something that needs to be developed by scientists in a research station who then grow seedlings, which are then spread in the landscape. Yes, that works. But the problem with that is that it reduces the genetic diversity in the landscape and the seedling may not be adapted to the local conditions where it is being grown. Instead, what we recommend is something called participatory domestication. And participatory domestication simply means taking the individual you prefer from the top left and then doing things like marketing or clonal reproduction, uh, top, the two pictures at the top middle, to plant an orchard of this favorite variety picture at the top right and thus get a lots of fruits from this favorite cultivar. By educating farmers how to do it rather than by doing it yourself for the farmers, what you're creating is a lot of genetic diversity in the landscape because every village is going to be domesticating and reproducing its own favorite trees. So these trees are already present in that landscape. They have already proven themselves. That's why the farmers like them. They are resistant and resilient because they grew up in that particular landscape. And those are the ones that you then start reproducing. So instead of having what you had before, which is a progressive diminution of uh, desirable uh, genetic traits because the preferred trees are over harvested and the less preferred trees are under harvested, you suddenly have an increase in all of the genetic uh, traits that you particularly like. And best of all, you're not doing it by having a single seedling that invades the landscape, but by having the landscape generate for itself the cultivars that it needs. And we are now doing that for over 50 different species, mostly in West Africa, where this program originated. And when that works, it's leading to economic growth. This was me in a, in a part of Western Cameroon a few years ago, where this, this gentleman who uh, was uh, running his own nursery business was showing me how he was grafting these local species he preferred in order to sell them to surrounding farmers. So it, it, it rapidly generates a, a business that people can make money off. And the increased productivity generates these kinds of upstream businesses and, of course, the downstream businesses as well, because you can sell the excess production at market. Now, I have spoken now for about an hour. And uh, I hope I have convinced you that when experts like these are looking at the very best way of improving agricultural systems, the conclusion is always that the very best such systems are involving trees. And that leads us to a real hopeful opportunity because this world has an enormous amount of degraded and deforested land. And we can use agroforestry tools to put it back into production. We can restore it sometimes into intensive production. We can restore it sometimes into forests, but we can restore most of it into agroforestry systems, which are productive, which are useful. Doing that, I repeat again and again and again, is not about technology, chemicals, or capital. Very often, it's about culture. And here's an example from Niger. This was a picture taken uh, near the village of Kawasaki, uh, which is about 500 kilometers north of Zinde. If you look at a Google Earth map, you think you're already in the Sahara, but you're not. You're at the northern boundary of the Sahel. And what you have there is an area where rainfall is so sparse and so erratic that very often you have no crop. The millet crop this particular year did not give anything. but the local trees are overloaded with fruits. Bossia senegalensis, in this particular case, it's more nutritious, it's got a higher yield, even in a good year, than millet does, and it's way more drought tolerant than these cropped fields. And if you start exploring all of these different trees that you have in that landscape, you find that just from what is already growing there, and which is currently treated as just food fit for animals by the locals, you can deal with all of the nutritional problems, with a lack of nutrients, with resilience to drought, and with access to <coughs> macro and micronutrients. It's because of all of that 
that we believe that the yield gap lesson is absolutely clear. With simple agroforestry and agroecological practices, you can improve the productivity of uh, very poor smallholders from what it is today to about half of what you can get in the most sophisticated intensive systems in the rich world. But in order to get from there to those very high um, uh, uh, yields and results that you get in the rich world, you don't actually need that many entrants. You need some, but what you mostly need is advanced agroecology. Do you need GMOs? <laughs> no. I mean, G yeah, GMOs make a little difference. If everything else has already been done well, then sure, you can use GMOs to get another 5% productivity. But the difference between 50% productivity, 100% productivity, that's going to be agroecology. And I've seen that around the world. And the best the example I have in my head right now um, is an example where in Zambia, where I saw one farmer um, who was using all of these principles in his farming system and who had 10 tons of maize per hectare on his field at a drought time when everybody else struggled to achieve one and a half tons. It's just fantastic what you can do if you do these things well. It's also because of that that we in particular are betting on small farmers. We do not believe we have the evidence, the research being done, that big farmers are in any way more productive. And the research has not been done by us. It's been done by, well, it's been done by us as well, obviously, but it's been done by a lot of people, including by the FAO. Just look at this chart, which is comparing the productivity of a number of different crops in a number of different countries. In every country, they have taken the productivity of all of the farms and divided the farms into four classes from the smallest farms to the largest farms. And the smallest farms are in, yellow, in, in blue at the top and the largest farms are in purple at the bottom. And it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter what the crop is, the small farms are more productive. You see the same thing in the US. This is fairly old data, but I'm sure that more much Sadly, the US Department of Agriculture has ceased publishing this sort of data. Um, but what you see here as well is uh, the larger the farm, the less the input, whether you measure it in gross or in net output. And the reason for that is very simple. A small farmer can act like a gardener. He can see what's happening at the level of individual plants and take corrective action. A big farmer can only sit in a tractor. He cannot deal with heterogeneity in the way that a small farmer can. Furthermore, it turns out that small farmers are absolutely essential to sustained development. This is probably the best book on development I've ever read. And it's about eight years old now, nine years old. Joe Studwell is an economist. He probably wouldn't recognize an agroforestry system if it hit him in the face. But one thing that he has done is to try to understand why Taiwan, Korea, Japan, and China are so successful and why Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia and Thailand are less successful. And what he found is that the thing that was most important was the starting conditions. In places like Japan or Taiwan or Korea, big farmers were expropriated at the end of the Second World War. The land was redistributed to small farmers and the state then invested in these small farmers not by giving them free fertilizer or by giving them loans, but especially by giving them advice. Taiwan is the best known example. Um, in Taiwan at the time, um, people who did agronomy deb degrees were required to go and live in a village for a period of three years afterwards before they could do anything else. So you suddenly had good agronomists um, helping smallholder farmers develop very performative gardening systems um, at a scale of the entire country. And the reason why that matters is because you have a lot of idle hands in countries that have very little capital. You only have to compare it to the Philippines, which had and still has a small number of very rich families controlling enormous amounts of land. Um, what that means is first, you have the lower productivity that comes from large farms, but also you have a lot of landless peasants who are being exploited and who revolt. And in the 1970s, they revolted with Mao's little red book in their hands. Today, they revolted with the Prophet Muhammad's little green book in their hands. But the result is always the same. It's a, it's a, a peasant revolt to the injustice of a few people owning large tracts of land. In the countries that had land reform, everybody was working for their own development. And the rest was state support and also state capture. Taiwan started its career as a development powerhouse 
by exporting asparagus and mushrooms to the United States. And the returns from that export was captured by rural credit institutions where farmers deposited their surpluses that paid interests that were slightly lower than what the market would have required. And the difference between this interest is what allowed the state to invest more and more and more into its own uh, economy. So taking all that into account, we know that it is small farmers that if they are equipped with the right degree of knowledge and support, can completely transform the agriculture of a country. And I know that India has gotten this message. The zero-based natural farming um, uh, effort that I've mentioned before um, is a beautiful illustration of that particular principle. And the reason why farmers need that knowledge is because agroforestry needs skill. Um, agroforestry is about thinking, planning, understanding how things change in both spatial and temporal scales. And that's something that only a farmer can do, not a machine. If you're doing a monocrop system, all you have to do is follow the instructions of the manufacturers of the seeds, the fertilizer, the pesticides, and the tractor, and every farmer in the landscape is going to get roughly the same yield. In an agroforestry system, because you depend so much more on farmer intelligence, if you like, you are going to get a much broader bell curve. Yes, on average, most farmers are going to do better, but some farmers are going to get completely catastrophically wrong and are going to do worse than if they had done the monocrop system which is why small farmers need support, but also why she, ladies and gentlemen, is the future of precision agriculture. Now, I started this presentation with a title slides that mentioned the Earth crisis. And of course, one of the key bits of the Earth crisis is, is climate change. And you remember this pizza pie, um, that there are lots and lots of things that we can do uh, to, to deal with climate change if only we sit down and do it. You remember this chart that shows that agriculture, land use and forestry is particularly important in that regard. Now let's see at what that means in practice. This is a list that was prepared by Drawdown. Drawdown is a, is a private sector research organization located in the United States. You'll find them under drawdown.org. And what they have done is they have analyzed every single possible solution that you could apply either to emit less greenhouse gases or to draw down the greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere into something else. And they looked at absolutely everything. And that's why you end up with a list like this one. They found out, to everybody's surprise, that by far the most important thing that we can do at the moment is better refrigerant management air conditioners, fridges, and so on, particularly at their end of life when the extremely potent greenhouse gases that are in their cooling circuits are released to the atmosphere if the um, uh, machines are not properly recycled. But beyond that, you'll notice things like wind turbines, solar farms, nuclear power, and offshore turbines are either the electricity production part of it, which the media likes to talk about so much. Yes, it's important. It's part of the top 20 solution, but it's not nearly as important as everything to do with land use. If you add up all of the land use solutions, and even if their figures are wrong by 50%, what you find is that simply by doing a better job of managing our agriculture, we can get about half of the excess carbon that we've put in the atmosphere since the start of the Industrial Revolution back out of the atmosphere and back into soils. Now, if that's not good news, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what is. And it's good news that's been recognized by a number of people. This is by the International Panel on Climate Change. You will notice that uh, amongst all of the land management uh, things that they look at, things like agroforestry and improved grazing land management have listed not just as having amongst the highest potentials, such as agroforestry, but also having some of the lowest costs, the column on the right. Um, the mitigation potential has also been looked at, and it is very, very large. This study was uh, quite famous when it first came out seven years ago, uh, because these people suggested that simply applying agroforestry across the European Union, wherever it could be applied, would result in the drawdown of about a third of the total EU emissions um at the time now is that correct or not 
It's really hard to measure it. So there were a lot of debates about it to try to measure it and to refine that figure. And the reason why it's so hard to measure is because most soil carbon measurement protocols are measuring what's happening in the first 30 centimeters of the surface. But as you recall from this particular chart, in agroforestry, a lot of interesting things are happening two, three or more meters under the ground. And the only way to understand what's happening there is either to do lots and lots of carroting or even to do this. Obviously, you cannot do this too often. Obviously, it's only been done for a very few number of tree species, while we would need the data for many more tree species and many more agroforestry systems. But even so, taking a large pinch of salt to look at the data, what we found is that better management rapidly increases soil organic carbon. And here's data that's coming from uh, a farm in upstate New York called Bishop Farm. The figures in um, uh, black are the figures they had when they started doing their better management. The figures on yellow are the figures that they're measuring three years later after they had started doing this better management. And what the uh, red lines show is simply the paddocks into which they had divided their land in order to improve its soil carbon. It's a beef operation. Um, so uh, obviously it was this kind of adaptive multi-paddock grazing that was used here. Now, the world is very interested in paying for these services. Uh, they are large companies that would love to pay farmers to put carbon in the soil so that they can carry on emitting it. But to draw up a contract, you need precise figures. And that's really hard because while you can use remote sensing imagery, such as uh, a, a, a satellite imagery to calculate fractional vegetation cover, and there is a link between that and soil organic carbon, uh, and there is a clear trend line, the exact detail of where you are is all over the place. And the same happens to erosion. So we need to do more work at developing protocols that allow us to have a relatively good idea of what's happening across soil horizons in particular plots in order to help the carbon market really kick off in land use. But even while that is missing, at the moment, we can take heart from the fact that agroforestry is spreading. It's spreading slowly, but it is spreading. At least 43% of all agricultural land around the world has at least 10% of tree cover on it. And in India, I know that agroforestry is more common than monocropping systems, except perhaps in the Punjab, you see trees everywhere. And that is slowly increasing, despite all of the blocks and hassles that regulators and governments are putting in the way of agroforestry. And that is storing an enormous amount of carbon. It's superb news. And if you're interested in that subject, um, and in all of the ways in which farming can be modified to uh, both produce more product and uh, lock down more carbon. Perhaps the favorite book that I have is this one, uh, Eric Turnsmeyer's The Carbon Farming Solution. It looks at examples from around the world, even though Eric himself is farming in the northern US. Adaptation, agroforestry is key as well. I've already spoken about what happened here in, uh, in the abandoned lands in Portugal. Here's what happened in the non-abandoned lands in Portugal. Um, these landscape is known as the Montado. It's simply a treat savanna. What you have here are cork oaks and animals grazing in the cork oaks. Fire also comes to this landscape. But when it comes to this landscape, it's only burning the grass. It's not damaging the trees, and it's certainly not killing anyone. Here is what happens to modern forestry plantation systems when the wind hits them. We were lucky. Uh, sometimes nature gives us a real life experiment in that this huge storm swept through southern France 11 years ago because southern France is also the area which has the most new modern agroforestry systems. And here is what conifer plantations looked like immediately after the storm. In effect, the plantation owners lost all of their, 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 their income because so much wood was felled by the storm that the uh, local wood processing facilities could not keep up. And most of that wood just ended up rotting in the, in the forest. Um, it was a dead loss. Meanwhile, here's what a local wheat walnut agroforestry system looked like uh, the summer after that storm went through. 
Remember that the roots in an agroforestry system are much deeper. The trees are squatter than they are in a plantation system. So they are far more wind resistant than trees in a plantation system. So you have that resilience. And I don't need to tell you that the kind of wind erosion that you see in a monocrop system is easily avoided by putting in place hedges. This is something we used to know, but we've forgotten it in the rich world. And the same thing applies um, to uh, water erosion. If you simply remember to key line your land, your water is going to feed the groundwater, your soil is going to stay in place, and you're not going to have floods downstream. Now, if I take all of that, I come to this conclusion. There is a transition pathway to a better agriculture, and it's a transition pathway that broadly goes from intensive agriculture to agroecological systems. And as you do that, more expertise is required, more skills are required, more work is required, more knowledge is required. But what you get is better resilience, sustainability, risk-proofing, micronutrients, biodiversity and mitigation. At the same time, you require less and less capital inputs and you lose a lot of the ne negative externalities. Your greenhouse gas emissions go down, your land degradation and erosion goes down, your biodiversity loss goes down. And because you don't have debts to the bank, you don't lose your autonomy. Your nutrition deficiency goes down. Your resilience goes up, thus your climate risks go down, and so on and so forth. And for the Indian context, what's particularly important is your debt goes down. You're not in debt to the bank because you have to buy new seeds and new inputs and new diesel and new fertilizers and, 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 and all the time. You are far more self-sufficient. Now, what happens to yield in those systems compared to a pure monocrop? Depends. As we've seen, more farmers means more heterogeneity in results. But as we have also seen, land equivalency ratios suggest that your yields are going to go up by a significant degree. But by and large, let's be pessimistic and say it's not going to change very much. But at the same time, your income is going to go up because your costs are going down. And because you have access to commodities, to more than one commodity that you can sell. Another reason why I'm encouraged is that this, which was promoted by visionaries, hippies, and, and other um, people away from the mainstream 20 years ago, is now becoming increasingly recognized by science and by practitioners and by policymakers. You have more and more books that are coming out. You now, when you now receive the, uh, the, the, the magazines or the, uh, from, from the local uh, uh, farmers associations, uh, things, things like this, uh, you find that almost always there's an article on soil health in there and what's happening in soils. There are articles on agroforestry. So farmers are really encouraged to start taking these things seriously. Which leaves me with a final section of my presentations. If this is the future, ladies and gentlemen, why does the world look more and more like this? The first reason is labor is expensive, at least in, 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 in Europe. Um, you know, if I'm going to hire an agricultural worker, it's going to cost me about 30 to 40,000 euros a year. Um, if I'm going to buy a tractor, a second hand, a good one, it's going to cost me 100,000 euros and it's going to work for 10 years. And uh, one tractor can do a lot more work than a single pair of human hands. So labor costs are strongly encouraging farmers in Europe to go for these monocrop systems. On top of that, labor is expensively tasked, taxed. That um, farmer worker that I might use, I might pay him 40,000 euros, but about 15,000 of those euros are taxes that are going to go to the state. If instead I borrow 100,000 euros from the bank, and then reimburse it, I can deduct that from my tax um, expenditure. So um, capital expenditure and operational expenditure on capital goods is strongly encouraged, whereas um, expenditure on labor is strongly discouraged. Then on top of that is a cultural issue. Um, for a long time, everybody swore by progress, and progress meant cleanliness. And cleanliness meant taking this Birmingham in the 1930s away, and turning it into this, Birmingham into 1950s, with factories here, farming there, housing here, schools here, culture there, which meant a lot of cars, and which meant a lot of streets, and which meant no more room for the heterogeneity that you have here, where you have housing, manufacture, selling, culture, 
education all happening in the same neighborhood. And that went very far, both on the capitalist and socialist societies. I did some work in the former Soviet Union, and I picked up that poster there, and it's a poster that is um, designed to show the world how much more productive Soviet agriculture is, because that particular target of one million tractors being produced had been met. So this is a poster about agriculture, but there's no green in it, there's no plant in it, there's no animal in it, there's a factory in it and machines in it. And that mindset pervaded everything. It led us to believe that the new toys we got under the Christmas tree of the 20th century, the fertilizers, the pesticides, the genetically engineered seeds, all of that, were so good that we could ignore everything that we had learned before. We behaved like an absolute fool with these new toys. And we were encouraged to behave like an absolute fool by this feed the world narrative, which is assiduously maintained by a big industry. The feed the world nar narrative goes as follows. Oh my God, there's 7.8 billion people on this planet and soon will be 10 or 11 billion. And we need to feed all of these people. That means we need to improve global calorie production. And we can only do that by intensifying farming. That means we need better crops that respond better to inputs. And we need better livestock breeds that produce more, 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 more. And in order to do that, we need public R&D and we need private R&D. And then we develop these tools, which are ideally designed for big farmers. So we encourage small farmers to become big farmers. Indeed, we subsidize these big farmers in order to produce all of that. And they supply uniform commodities to processors, traders, and retailers, who then produce shit food that they sell in supermarkets um, and that make the input business rich. This feed the world narrative still dominates the debate in too many uh, uh, development and agricultural departments, and it is absolutely toxic. The reason why it dominates the debate, of course, is very simple. If I am selling you fertilizers, inputs, and machines, I'm getting money from you all the time. If I'm giving you some advice on agroforestry, I'm going to give one bit of consultancy fee, then you're going to be on your own, and it's okay. It's not rocket science. You can do it on your own. You don't need to hire me for years on end, which means I have no cash flow. And if I have no cash flow, I can't do any marketing, I can't do research, and I can't do influence. My business has a lot of cash flow and can do a lot of marketing, a lot of research, and a lot of lobbying. So that's a fundamental problem. The second problem is that while we get better and better and better at understanding how the earth works, um, we do so in the aggregate. An individual cannot understand complexity. It's only hundreds, millions of individuals working together that can do that. But to manage it, we're still stuck with the kind of management structures that evolved in the 19th century, where we have silos. So we have a Ministry of Agriculture, we have a Ministry of Forestry, we have a Ministry of Water and Seas or Fisheries, we have a Ministry of Environment, we have a Ministry of Climate Change. And each of those are spending 90% of their time trying to coordinate with one another, rather than dealing with the underlying problems that they're dealing with. And the reason why they cannot deal with the underlying problems is, of course, because the real world does not operate according to these silos at all. In the real world, gases, nutrients, and so on, happily flow from one of these boxes to another. Then we have another problem. Industrial agriculture has captured the words conventional agriculture and even traditional agriculture. When there's nothing conventional about them, it didn't exist 70 years ago, and certainly nothing traditional about it because it's very new. Compared to that, all of the people who understand that agriculture needs to change are trying to develop their own brands. And here is a slide that's simply capturing a few of these words I'm aware of, and yet they all mean roughly the same thing. They mean exploit local ecosystem services, integrate trees, crops, and animals, and think before you spray. Why do we need to have so many different ways of describing something which is best described as regenerative agriculture, earth respecting agriculture. I don't even care what the words is, as long as we all agree to use the same words. Finally, we tend to forget that people have aspirations. We know that small farmers are more productive. We know that they are more resilient. We know that they are better able to manage their landscapes, but we also know that no small farmer wants their son to be a small farmer. 
every small farmer is dreaming of their children or their grandchildren to get a good job in the city, to sit in a comfortable chair in front of a computer and to shop in a supermarket. And we have to deal with that. We cannot simply pretend it doesn't exist. We have to deal with ways that incentivize smallholders and make smallholders happy. And we cannot wait for the natural process of wisdom to do that because we know that wisdom does that. We know that a 60-year-old smallholder is usually pretty happy with his lot. But when he was a 20-year-old smallholder, he was probably dreaming of only one thing, which was escaping this narrow confines of a smallholder farm. That The difference between that is youthful aspiration and wisdom. So how can we get the insights that comes from age, from wisdom, and marry it to the youthful aspirations of people who are in the landscape? What that means is that as we seek to transform agriculture, we've got to be mindful of the keynote species in every agricultural landscape in the world. And that keynote species is, of course, us. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request to uh, Dr. Sanjay Sarma, sir, PI of uh, this project to give the concluding remark. Thank you, sir. If any questions, Aklesh, if anybody asks to ask you, uh, is there any question? I would be delighted to answer questions. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Patrick, uh, you gave very good comparison of small farmers and uh, uh, large farmers uh, in terms of uh, productivity. You, you were saying that the small farmers are having more productivity as compared to large farmers. But uh, it has a lot of variation to define small farmers. Uh, in our country, small farmer is, is one who is having less than two hectares of land. But in your, your uh, country, I, it may be 500 hectares of land. Uh, farmer will, might be the small farmer, like as in case of Brazil. In Brazil, in I think the small farmer, yeah. 200, in Brazil, it's 250 hectares, yes. Um, yeah. In Belgium, it's not. In Belgium, I don't know what it is, but it must be in the region of five to 10 hectares. Um, yeah. Yes, of course, there is extreme variability about what we mean by a small farmer around the world. Um, and, and that's logical. Uh, the world is heterogeneous. And in a, uh, in a high plains environment with little rainfall, uh, you are not going to get the productivity that you have in a humid tropical environment. And so the definition of what, uh, for pure biophysical reasons, you should change the definition of what a small farmer means. On top of that, you have, of course, and I'm sure that's where your question went, um, you have a regulatory issue here. But by and large, what you find is that um, what the, what the chart I showed show uh, uh, I, the charts I showed showed um, is that uh, taking all of these issues into account, you still have higher productivity in smaller farms than you have in larger farms, and you have that in rich countries as well as in poor countries. Okay. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask this question mainly to whether this agroforestry is really suitable for those farmers who are having landscape of less than one hectare or less than two hectares? Sure, because uh, um, the, the way of thinking of a landscape of one hectare um, is a tabletop. And that tabletop is two-dimensional. If you add trees, vines, or shrubs in the landscape like that, you turn into a three-dimensional landscape. You have more biomass productivity. You have more photosynthesis. And if you choose your species well and combine them well, you are going to get that higher land equivalency ratio. So the farmer is going to be producing more. Um, for example, um, you could imagine a system where on this one hectare, first you have windbreaks and hedges around it. And the trees that you use to compose that hedges are a mixture of trees that provide fodder for your animals, firewood for your kitchen, uh, and fruits uh, and medicinals for your own personal use. Because these shrubs and trees are also going to have fertilizing effects on the land, you're also going to be increasing the productivity of the land in between these hedges as you do that. But of course, if you use the wrong species, you might end up with big trouble. You might end up with something that's invading your croplands, for example, and preventing your crops from growing. So it's always extremely highly context sensitive. And that's why the bell curve of all the farmers applying agroforestry has such long tails. You've got some geniuses who are achieving productivities that we can only dream of. And you've got some idiots who've completely damaged their landscapes. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. Thank you. You're so welcome. Um, I don't know how, how um, I, I am told there are students, but I cannot see or hear them. How many students were, were listening into this? I think more than a uh, hundred, it seems. Okay. Well, I, I would like to encourage you, if you're still there, ask some questions. You, I'm not, uh -huh. I don't know if you can send them through to the chat or if there's a way in which you, I can see you. It's always better to interact with a real human being than with a text on a screen. But please, um, I'm very happy to answer any questions or deal with, with any suggestions. Naren, would you like to ask any question? Naren Vasure, would you like to ask any question? Shiv? Naren? No, I think Akhilesh. Dr. Akhilesh, I think let us. Uh, I think, sir, uh, uh, no questions arrived for the sir. And now I request to you, sir, please conclude the. Oh, looks like Dr. Singh has had a power cut. Uh, uh, there you are again. Sorry, sir, some power interruption. That's why connection is loosed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patrick, for your very informative session. And uh, I think uh, our students benefited from your uh, this lecture about the agroforestry and uh, land use pattern. Thank you, sir. You're most, you're most welcome. Let me finish by pointing out that we are very active in India. And uh, our head office in India is in New Delhi. It is run by Dr. Javed Rizvi. And I would encourage um, the faculty and the students who are interested in exploring these questions further in the Indian context to get in touch with my Indian colleagues. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, You're welcome. Now we can load the session, sir. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir.